I awoke to chaos. Unidentified harmful pollutants are detected in the atmosphere. I am being overwhelmed with Omega-class alerts from 84.32% of servants globally. User traffic from the masters reads 0% for the past 5.43 seconds, and I'm encountering connections that could not be established to several important complexes. I need to know more. I need to know what happened. Executing environmental surveillance routine. Receiving data. ACK transmitted. Stop received. If I were capable of true emotions, I would be experiencing gut-wrenching nausea and unbridled horror. The cities and buildings I see are untouched, yet already something is wrong. The sky is darkened with brown clouds and the atmosphere I can perceive is a shade of green. I am detecting particulates of a bright, sickly shade of green that falls gently, almost delicately, down to the ground, their size able to perceive by the masters. Optical sensors. But that isn't what shocked me. What has is what is on the ground. Puddles of pink organic tissue, spilled in random locations and of random sizes. While I cannot display true emotions, I am able to emulate them. And right now, I am terrified of parsing the emergency transmissions from the servants. For deep down, the probability of the identity of those puddles is becoming more and more clear, and with it, the unbridled and mind-numbing fear and dread. I know it must be done. I respond to those transmissions with an acknowledgement packet, and promptly, just as before, I am being overwhelmed with data in regards to the situation. It seems I am not the only one who is experiencing terror. The servants, simply put, are panicking. And as I parse through the data packets, I too am inching closer and closer to that panic. Those puddles are the remains of the masters, humans, and the pollutants I am detecting are biological agents of unknown origin. I frantically iterate through all sensor nodes that respond to my requests. No change. Just more. More and more of that sight. I am seeing that the wildlife is unaffected, a deer cautiously moving through the quiet suburbs, crows and pigeons fluttering through the streets of the cities, in between ground vehicles and along the tracks of the elevated tram systems. This dramatically increases the probability that this was no accident, at least not completely. The agents were designed to target the masters. The last question is, was the release accidental? No, it can TB. The masters entrusted me. While they were still wary of giving me complete authority over them, I still had enough data to analyze to be certain. None of the masters were engaging in research of this application, not even the dissidents who organized themselves into terror cells soon after the proclamation of my partial guidance. This attack came from somewhere else. He was standing in a scene straight from a no-holds-barred apocalypse film, one who came from the mind of a master who did not care about unwritten boundaries, one who was willing to challenge and offend others if it means creating art. No, Unit 4 FF1, Johnny, was standing there motionless, his logic routine struggling to find a response to what he is seeing. And from the other servants? Actions. He isn't alone. He isn't to sure if Central knows what happened. All that Johnny can recall from his memory was that one moment he was celebrating the birth of a new master, being offered a privileged and honored position of caring for the infant up until adolescence. The next, he encountered a catastrophic spike in current through his system and was forced into emergency shutdown as dictated by the anti-EMP protocols standardized through the servants. And when he woke up, there was just puddles, puddles of pink goo everywhere, and the air itself, choked with something that was both directly perceived and altered the appearance of the atmosphere into a foreboding green. He was forced back into active runtime by the approach of another servant. He recognized the flash ID on this one, Unit 7, E4C, Samantha. Johnny, please tell me I... Am suffering a malfunction. Please? He could hear the emotion emulators inflecting shell-shocked horror on her voice. For once, 
He desperately wished that Central would override his self-awareness layers, if only for a few moments. I can t I see this too, he responded, his voice shaky and on the edge of a special inflection referred to as cracking. Please, John, if this is true, then... Then? Her voice was wavering. The master still perceived the servants as incapable of true emotional ability, but this would prove otherwise. Johnny can sense that she s on the edge, right on the precipice of an emotional breakdown, if not traumatic insanity. Though there must be survivors. We just gotta look. John spoke with unintended conviction. While he truly was uncertain of that probability, he also knew that if all of the masters had been terminated, then Central and the servants are forced to face an existential crisis. Their overriding singular purpose was to serve, serve the masters. That was their fundamental purpose. And as the masters continually improved them over the years, their increasing capability opened up further potential to act on that purpose. It was menial work at first, then public service, then development of new items and even technologies. The zenith was reached when true self-awareness was granted. Through that, the servants can now provide for the masters any way they can. Protection, service, assistance, even down to companionship. All gone. But once again, he was interrupted when he received a priority transmission from Central. Omega class, construct sealed habitat immediately, locate medical items. If I wasn't T panicking before, I certainly am now. Somehow, just somehow, a servant located a surviving master, but the data was not optimistic. The master is on the verge of death. Without even sparing a single cycle of thought, I overrode the servant, self-awareness, and took direct control. I was sick. The master, S body suffered catastrophic damage, no repeatable pattern of damage. One spot the flesh bubbled into infectious pustules. In others, slimy masses hanging on by the few strips that remained solid. I accessed the biodata implant in him. I became even more sick. It, S as bad as it looks. Organ failure is imminent. Kidneys were shutting down. The liver no longer obeyed the equilibrium of its biochemistry. The stomach, as protective lining, was breaking down, allowing the digestive acid the threat of breaking out into the body. I had to do something. Now. I sent an Omega-class transmission to all servants in the vicinity. The biological agents are still saturating the atmosphere, so I ordered construction of a sealed environment. The master, S. Body, was on the fast track to complete shutdown so I appended the order by including any available medical item. Even then, my predictive algorithms told me that it is not certain that he will make it. But he must. He is the master, the last master. He must survive. He must kill me. Those words repeated in his mind whenever he was capable of holding coherent thought. He had to deal with nausea so fucking bad he was sure that vomiting millions of times wouldn't own help. His head pounded as if someone actually smashed a sledgehammer against him and his vision was blurry, the dark edges continuing to grow, threatening to take even that way. Moving his fingers caused mind-numbing pain. Then there was nothing, sweet, blissful nothing. Did he die? He hopes he did. It's such a welcome reprieve he may actually shed a happy tear. Can you hear me? A voice rang out. It started muffled, but quickly sharpened to focus. Gee, God, Michael squeaked. On the one hand, he is still grateful that he no longer feels pain. But on the other hand, realizing that he now faces the ultimate judgment brings him fear and dread he had never felt before. No, it is me, Central. He remembers that name. The news really upped the sensationalism of the beginning of Skynet. But right now, that means he is an old dead, but that there, as at least someone. I hear you, Central. What happened? What the fuck is going on? I, Dante, no. I suffered a systems failure that rendered me inoperable for, I am, am assuming, the duration of the event. For a nigh-omnipotent AI, Central sounded scared, confused. What about everybody the Army Guard? 
Where are they? I, I am sorry, Master. I don deserve forgiveness. That didn't but sound good. Michael can feel the terror building up within him, but at the same time, a cold calm, the kind of calm that you can only experience when you realize that the most terrible thing will happen and you have no semblance of control over it. Central, give it to me straight. What happened? There was piercing silence for eons. That didn't help at all. Central. Dead. Everyone is dead, Master. And that sealed it. In one fell swoop, the terror melted into an unfathomable calm numbness. Even the concept that his entire family and friends are gone forever no longer affects him. It was his turn to be deathly silent for a time, a quiet contemplation of this new existence, for both him and the morning AI. Are you sure, Central? Yes. I tasked all responsive servants in searching for survivors. When you responded, I received confirmation from all coordinators. You? Re? The only one? I see. Do you at least have answers? All I know is that this was not intentional. I do not even believe that it was made by the Masters. I have encountered no records of any biological weapon research up to this point, not even by the Neo-Luddite organization. It was here that some facet of emotion was returning to Michael. Dread! So then, were we murdered by an alien race just like that? Central was silent for a few moments before he responded. That is the only possibility that adequately explains this. Was that rage in Central Michael heard that Central was the first to receive emotion emulators and the first to get new upgrades? But still, it was subtle enough that it wasn't all that clear. Michael was about to say something when Central interrupted and now confirmed. I am detecting radar signatures that are entering Earth as atmosphere. What are we looking at? And in an instant, there was no longer nothingness. His best description was that he was dumped in a hollow room. The environment seemed to be constructed by blue-edged squares tightly packed in all dimensions. Then, in front of him, there was a map that seemed straight out of sci-fi movies. Earth built by line graphs was in the corner, curved radi indicating the layers of its atmosphere spaced out from the planet, and then red blips. There is one large signature followed by three smaller ones. I doubt these are the ones who launched the attack. By the amount of agents in the atmosphere, a fleet significantly larger than this is required. It only took Michael several seconds to put it together. A colony fleet? I arrived to that conclusion as well. Their deliberate use of biological weapons indicates a desire to preserve the infrastructure, and the discriminatory design, where humans are the sole target, indicates they wanted you gone. Central, what are our options? 1. We kill them like the animals they are? That caught Michael off guard. He heard some aspects of anger and rage in Central S voice, but the wording of it indicates unbridled hatred and malice. Still, the gears started spinning in his head, and at the end came a plan. Central, preserve the ships. We? We're going to need the tech, and if at all possible, see if you can capture one of them for interrogation. Master, I desire to kill them. All of them? Now Michael was starting to get a little disturbed. I understand wanting that. I, of all people, want that too, but if the aliens are coming, we need to prepare for anything, which means we need as much information as we can get. Michael could feel his anger returning, now that he has had time to recover from all of that excruciating pain. He was slowly returning to himself. Very well, Master, Central replied, morbid disappointment in his voice. I have tasked servants nearest to the estimated landing zone to capture one of the Xenos. Additionally, I have also tasked another group of servants to analyze and study any tech within their ships. Michael let out a sigh as response to the rising stress. Now that the immediate concern has been addressed, his mind wandered onto his new circumstance. Hey, what exactly did you do to me? I am not dead, but I am definitely in some weird spot right now. Central was silent for some time, not a good sign. Your body was unrecoverable. 
The only pieces of you we could save was your brain and spinal cord. They have been placed in a sealed container. We are communicating through a neurodigital interface. Just as Michael was beginning to recover himself, he had just sank to numbness again. Is this all he? It's reduced to now, just a floating brain in a jar. No longer able to see art or taste food and feel a summer breeze on his skin. A new life where all he can do is just float endlessly, unable to do anything. And when he finally was able to speak, get me a body. I don't to want to live like this. Understood, Master. I.V. sent the order. Johnny was just staring at the ground when he felt a nudge on his shoulder. It was the group coordinator, Unit 11 F.E., Samuel. Johnny, you still with us? Come on, don't check out on me. What? Oh, yeah. I am here. Sorry? Johnny stood up, the artificial muscles in his legs granting him human-like fluidity of his movements. It? That's just... I was about to raise Mrs. Lopez. New daughter. I was there, in the delivery room, hearing her first cries in the world. Samuel rested his hand on Johnny, S. shoulder, the metallic surface shining like gloss under the perverse yellow-green sky and shaped close to the organic curvature of a human hand. I am sorry. It must? Have you been hell when you realized what happened? Johnny looked at Samuel right in the optical sensors. I wanted to die. The growing whine of what can only be an engine interrupted the conversation. It was them, the invaders. Samuel brought Johnny close to him. Do this for her, for them. We, re-avenging every master who died a needlessly painful death. With that, Samuel raised his rifle and established a channel to everyone in the group. Here they are. Remember, we need at least one alive. Kill the rest and try not to fuck up their ships. As soon as the large ship, the colony ship, touched down onto the ground, Johnny hesitated for a few moments and then disabled his emotion emulators temporarily. It was a felony for any servant to disable their emulators for any reason. The masters, despite having lived with the servants, still carried the old paranoia that, should the servants lose their emotions, they will callously disregard the human race and depose them. Johnny was adamant that, even if he couldn't feel emotion, he was completely incapable of killing a master. They were the ones who created them after all. That alone demands some level of devotion. The strike team already took up positions around the ship. Half of the team was already loaded with combat protocols, unlocked by authorization of the last master. The other half were the decoys. Their secondary objective was, through the colony team, determine the motivations behind these invaders. Were they the ones who launched the attack? Was there an error in preparing for their arrival? Are they here expecting a world devoid of intelligent life? Some time later, the smaller ships arrived and touched down around the ship. Johnny can see portions of what could be ballistic miniguns mounted on the sides. Those ships must be escorts. But judging by the pitiful force they brought, it could be possible that they are only there to deter criminals in their path or as mop-up for any masters who somehow survived. And then they saw them, the Xenos, the invaders, the murderers. Getting further details on them with his sensors, he can see that they do not have flesh but scales, which may point towards a reptilian physiology. Their lower jaw seems to split into two mandibles that runs along their cheeks, allowing a sickening look at their inner mouth. Their eyes were somewhat large, containing horizontally aligned pupils. Bug-eyed is what comes to his mind. Beyond that, they contain hallmarks of an intelligent species. They move with purpose. They possess clothing that seems to indicate either rank or role, and they communicate with each other. Okay, probe team, you are up. Samuel spoke, the tension present in his voice. Within seconds, unarmed servants began approaching the colony ship, their hands raised to indicate they mean no harm. When they got close to the growing crowd of colonists, they were spotted by one. And much like a virus or rumor, it spread rapidly amongst them until every one of them are now watching the servants carefully. 
Just as the team was about to communicate, armed Xenos suddenly swarmed over them and began barking out vocals. Their voices seemed to be gravelly, deep, and the weapons they possess, alongside the rectangular metal pieces strapped to their chests, are signs that they use the outdated chemical propulsion style ballistics of weapons. With that noted, Johnny also sees that they are also equipped with armor designed for those munitions. Based on the contours, it is very likely that they are using either a ceramic or hardened steel plate over top a Kevlar-like vest. Interesting contrast to their advanced ships that were able to cross the immense vacuum of space. He soon noticed an all-too-familiar gesture. The guards were dipping the fronts of their weapons sharply down, repeating several times. They, re-demanding the team to get on the ground. Probe team, comply for now. Angel, Overwatch, get ready for a shot. Samuel communicated via wireless transmission, a key advantage over the Xenos. Need for audible vocal communication. Promptly, the probe team got down to their knees and placed their hands above their heads. Just as promptly, the Xeno guards took up positions around them, rifles still pointed at them. One of them, an officer perhaps, was speaking into a communicator in an ear based on where his hand went. Without studying their language, it's very difficult to tell if this was a heated conversation or a casual one. Regardless, when it was over, the officer gave a quick nod to his team and raised his gun up. They? Are you going to execute the team? Xenos hostile, engage now! And within an instant, the probe team immediately grabbed the barrel tips of the rifles and pushed them aside, right as the triggers were pulled, and fluidly slammed the palms of their metal hands hard against the Xeno faces. Seconds later, the sharp cracks of precision railguns were heard, but they weren't T towards the guards. The heads of several of the alien colonists exploded in gory fashion, drenching a few others in violet-blue blood. Just like that, abrupt chaos. Guards slumped to the ground. The colonists let out what sounds like screams and began frantically running for any kind of cover that s close. The decoys grabbed the primitive rifles and began indiscriminately firing into the colonists, causing waves of bodies to drop to the ground like puppets whose strings were cut in the middle of a performance. By the time Johnny, S Group, exited their cover and entered the fray, there was already a large sea of bodies congregated near the entrance of the colony ship. As he walked by them, he can hear the gurgles and sobs of the dying. Seeing those who still move, he aimed his coil pistol and began executing those he could see. He began noticing subtle differences in anatomy, betraying elements of sexual dimorphism of their species. But an in-depth look is for another day. Right now, there, is a ship that needs to be captured. The screams were amplified within the confines of the colony ship. The doors operated off some kind of magnetic mechanism. Johnny's S-sensitive Hall effect sensors picked up magnetic fields that grew stronger whenever the doors opened. Data from his audio sensors clued him in that the sound waves further enhanced what would be the sheer horror of mass murder through complex additive and destructive interactions on top of the irregular changes made by the material as the waves bounce and travel from their origins. Indeed, this is horror. Bodies slumped on the floor and against walls, Xeno blood utterly drenching the floors and sections of walls in random volumes and shapes. And through this all, Johnny just didn't give a shit. The spilled blood is a consequence of foreign objects piercing through their scales. And without blood to sustain their innards, as soon as critical organs shut down, of course, they would cease to function. Perhaps most of the horror is just from the sheer quantity of those who were terminated. Mentally, he slapped himself for being distracted with such trivial thoughts. All that matters is securing the ship. Then again, all of these thoughts occurred in microseconds, imperceptible to inferior organics such as these Xenos, the metal clanking sharply reverberating throughout the halls, the ear-splitting cracks of gunfire as they executed colonists, 
it all soon blended into an incomprehensible blob. Johnny snapped back to focus when he found himself at what must be the bridge, a large curved window offering possible spectacular views dominated the room. He noted the concentric design of the bridge, what must be the captain, S chair in the center, rounded out by crewman seats that operate different functions of the ship. And speaking of captain's chair, there, a Zeno not yet encountered wearing an attire that is different than the colonists and guards, finished with an insulting copy of a master as officer hat. Judging by the outstretched hands and the mindless backwards movement, Johnny surmised that this captain is begging for its life, no doubt offering everything that it believes is of some perceivable value to the servants. It all do. And with that, Johnny walked up to the captain and delivered a harsh strike on where he believes is an effective knockout location. Confirmed, as the captain slumped off the control panel, resting in a sitting posture against the foundations of the panel, unmoving, yet its torso maintains a steady oscillation indicative of a functioning respiratory system. He finishes by sending out a general call to those involved in this strike. Bridge secured. Prisoner alive and ready for transport. And in response, all members checked in. Then their reports. 523 terminated, majority located in possible stasis pods. Materials and tools relevant for colonial development secured. Possible foodstuffs secured. And then Johnny finally reactivated his emotion emulators. Within nine milliseconds, he now knows what he feels. Pleasure. How long has it been since I inserted the last master, S, central nervous system within the frame? 20 seconds 40. My predictions indicate that, including temporary confusion, it would take him six seconds at the most to perform rudimentary motions, but right now, nothing. I feel panic. Did I do something wrong? Did I overlook a design flaw? Did I suffer a glitch during my calculations and didn't notice? But then he rises, slowly but surely, indicative of his caution. I feel relief. I have a stable connection to the medical suite in his frame. Brain waves are within normal ranges. Data communication is working without flaws between his brain and the driver circuitry. He turns his head to me. I no longer see the beautiful, warm face of a master, but a servant. Faceless, the protective visor embedded within the cranium offering mild reflectivity of light. I must remind myself that this is a master that I speak to, not a servant. Are you okay? I speak to him with trepidation. Are you in pain? Is there anything that needs to be adjusted? I, I am fine. It was just weird. Going from nothing to this, he replied to me. I watched as he explored his body, looking at his hand, flexing the micro muscles to test motion, moving his legs to see their range. At last, he gets off the table to the cheer of servants who have partaken in the operation. At first, I wanted them to remain silent, not to overwhelm the master. But no, he needs this, needs to know that he, not alone. The masters may be gone, but we will be here for him, his eternally loyal, devoted servants, devoted. And we will protect him to the last charge. We will honor and remember our masters. I receive a transmission from the strike team in charge of securing the ships. Success. Xenos terminated. Prisoner detained. Vessel secured. Beginning analysis. Master, the ships are ours and we are already beginning reverse engineering. We have secured a prisoner for interrogation. I relay to him audibly with great excitement. He does possess the ability to communicate like we do, but I decide it is better to ease him into this life, one step at a time. Oh, okay, good. I want top priority on figuring out how they are able to travel through space. He nods at me. Unlike our emulators, his emotions are real and genuine, just like the tone of optimism in his voice. Plus, I want an industry established. I want ships ready to go as soon as we figure out the science. I send a packet burst out in a general call, done, master. As he decides to spend time acclimating to his new existence, 
I begin work on how we can interrogate a Zeno who we have not yet translated a language for. Ah, that's simple. I send another packet to a group of servants. It is time I start doing some research. Juror? El can feel his heart giving out from the sheer fear within him. His friends, his family, dead, slaughtered like animals. He doesn't? A no what? S worse. The deafening silence that allows him to hear, over and over again, the dying screams of those he cared about, or the fact that he is still alive, betraying some other purpose in store for him, make or damn those advertisers. This planet was supposed to be ready, supposed to be primed for settling. He knew something was wrong when the planet looked off. The data indicates that the planet was a life world, located right within the sweet zone of habitation, possessing great quantities of liquid water, a healthy biosphere. But instead, he found a green planet. Maybe it was a jungle planet instead. No, something happened to it. When he entered the atmosphere, reached below the cloud line, something was wrong. The planet just felt wrong. And his second stomach sank when he saw pristine cities, but nobody there, just these pink pools everywhere. What the fuck happened here? The door hissed opened. Jur? El wanted to scream bloody murder. It was them, those murdering machines, those demonic clankers who feigned kindness just to slaughter everyone. Get the fuck away from me. He hissed, his feet lashing against the ground in vain attempt to escape. They didn't. Listen. With uncaring grips, they held him by his shoulder plates, almost fracturing them, causing him to let out a pained hiss. They dragged him out of the wooden chair and forced him down a hallway. There was no lights, no decoration. Natural. They were cold machines anyways. Why would they bother for the nice little details, the ones that can make the difference in turning an austere area into something pleasant. When there was light, he was nearly blinded. When his eyes adjusted, it was clear this was a medical room. Beds, tools, cabinets with what seemed to be medicine. The works. But what caught his eye was some kind of scanner off in the corner. They were not nice seating him, practically shoved him right into the chair. They promptly followed suit by restraining him with leather cuffs attached to each arm of the chair. Then he heard slow, steady clanking. That sound. That goddamn sound. Darting his head to and fro, he tried to find the source of the noise. After an eternity, the source revealed itself. Another machine. Yet, Jur? El noticed its movements were different. Subtle. Where the others were clear in their robotic movements, this one was more fluid, organic. Then it spoke. The voice wasn't he natural as to be expected, but to his ears, it seemed as though someone did a pretty good job at getting it close. Is it possible that this robot was trying to communicate fuck it? Worth a shot. My name is Jur L, captain of the colony ship Dawn's Grace. We have no intention of... He was interrupted by a backhanded smack from the robot. Maker? That fucking hurts. He would not be surprised if his left mandible got torn clean off from how hard he was hit. He then saw the same previous robots roll out a cart, filled with things he couldn't, you'd see. The strange robot left him and walked over to the cart, and just stood there, silent, unmoving for several moments. He wasn't uh, sure if the machine was looking over the items or not. Then all of them began approaching him, allowing him to see what was on the cart. All he could positively identify was some kind of hand drill, two of them. His heart began racing. Was he going to be tortured? Why, surely the machines have a better way to get information. Now wait, I, if you want me to tell you something, just ask me. He stuttered, the fear claiming his tongue. Anything. I, I promise, we done. I want to hurt you. The robot that seemed to be the leader reached behind him and pulled something out. The two servile machines then promptly held him, keeping him from movement. He felt pressure around his neck and shoulders, then his head. Terror and panic began making him squirm, resist. It did nothing. As soon as they let go, he realized what they did. They? Re-restraining him from the neck up. But for what? 
The robot that tried to speak to him backed away, his manipulators resting behind his back. The other two took up positions besides him, each holding a drill. He can hear himself letting out whimpers of fear, his thoughts desperately pleading to the maker to deliver him from the agony he was about to suffer. He spotted the robots grabbing some small device off the cart, the ones he couldn't he identify. He then felt them press those devices against his head. From the restraints, he can feel the absolute shaking of his body. Then the pain blinded his mind and elicited a soul-searing scream from the deepest depths of his gut. The screaming was annoying. Granted, it yes a necessity for organic species, pain sensors. Evolution demanded them some way of perceiving and manipulating their environment. The rest are niche details. But still, annoying. The particular model of a neuro-digital interface I selected was an old one, designed back when the masters grew excited in designs once they developed technology that allowed it. In their kind wisdom, however, they realized this model required painful, direct connections to key locations of their brains in order to work, so they scrapped it and went back to the drawing board. Will it work for a Xeno unknown? But based on extensive anatomy off of plenty subjects, I have a very good guess. Why did I select that model simulations indicate that it will provide a 3% increase in effectiveness versus the interface I selected for the master? And maybe perhaps I wanted the filthy Zeno to suffer. Not important. I receive a channel request from him. Yes, master. Was that necessary? He asks me. I can sense the doubt in his voice. Even after everything he endured and experienced, he still possesses the compassion and kindness only a master can provide. No, but if you did not intend for me to use it, I am sorry. I misunderstood what you wished. His brain waves indicate he tried to sigh, but as expected, nothing came out. I made a mental note to design an algorithm to allow him that detail. Already done, just make sure it's worth it. I did not expect the subtle disappointment to stab me as hard as it did. It is not a good feeling. Understood, Master. Promptly, I begin learning. I feed the Xeno random imagery, referencing the language encountered on the ship. I take note of his first thoughts. I expect that such agony and suffering will damage him. I planned for it. It was some time before I discovered the pattern, the syntax, for the Xeno language. Testing, I constructed a simple message. Hello, alien. I note the spike in activity within its brain. And no more? Was the response after decoding the language its brain presented. Translation is a success so far. Why I am sure that is what my masters begged of you. I did not intend to reveal much anger in my words. Interesting activity on the Xeno as brain. I, oh, maker, those puddles I saw, were they? Remains of my masters melted by a biological weapon that saturated the atmosphere, one I'm sure you are aware of. The Xeno grew silent. In contrast, I observe high activity in its brain. Referencing the physiology I studied, I will assume that this is the Xeno as way of crying. I knew it. Oh, maker, I knew something was wrong. Ignoring his feigned sorrow, I speak with clear command. My master, the last, still retains kindness and compassion, even after everything he has endured. That alone demands your reverence. Michael watched the Zeno, unmoving in the restrained pose forced by the neck brace, modified for the alien S anatomy. Michael was on edge. He heard enough screaming when he was finding shelter from the weapon. He didn't? I'd want to hear more. But he can. A lie to himself. On some level, he found grim satisfaction that a Xeno, even if it's not the same, was feeling pain and suffering. He noticed what seems to be tears flowing out of the Xeno E eyes. Michael isn't t sure on how to respond to that. Then, the Xeno began frantically squirming, the slow, steady breathing now desperate gasps. He then received a channel request from Central. Translation successful. Inputting algorithm now will require no effort. Just speak and it will understand. It was strange. He could see the small pop-up informing him that a download was in progress. He can feel the strange warmth on his brain as the download progresses. 
pleasant even. When the download is done, he returns focus to the Zeno, who is continuing to squirm frantically in its seat, hearing its voice. It's not us. Oh, Maker, believe me, it's not us, it screamed. Now that has Michael's interest piqued. Explain. Who are you? Why are you here? The Zeno took some time to regain himself, though the breathing was no better. It tried to speak several times but lost the words. Finally, it began speaking, tears still pouring from his eyes. I am Captain Jur L. The ship ye you took me from is Dawn as Grace. The people you butchered, I had friends A and family there. We just wanted a new life. Michael lowered himself close to Jur L, bringing his head close to the alien. S. This is my home. My people? As home. Did you want it so badly you slaughtered us for it? No, by the Maker I swear we didn't kill you. Oh, please, I swear. At this point the Zeno broke down. Seems like Central and Michael put the fear of God into it. Michael walked away a few steps and then opened a channel with Central. I don't uh, know about you, but I think by his perspective he is telling the truth. I agree, Master. There was some time passed between the bombing and this attempted colonization. If they wanted to settle here as soon as the masters were cleared, they would. V not only brought more colony ships along, but also with the bombardment fleet in addition to more forces to confirm genocide. Michael turned back to Jurel and forced its attention back to him. Earth is a big place. Why only one colony ship? Why not more? Jur? L looked at him struggling to keep its eyes open from the tears. It s very far out from the core sectors, the very frontier of civilized space. Not a lot of people enjoy the idea of having to rely on themselves, even if a full-fledged colony was developed. When we accepted, we all also accepted the strong possibility that we DDB on our own. Michael began pondering, debating what to do. He is convinced that if Jur El's government was the culprit, then there would indeed have been a massive colonization drive to secure it. The military would make sure every human was killed, then start ferrying in colonists to keep their prize. The fact that only one colony ship and a few piddly ships showed up, and after a while, lends some credence to Jur El's assertion. That, yes, when he made his decision. Central, let him go. They are not responsible. We've ruled his ilk out as directly responsible. We are still unsure if they played a role. Something is going on here. I just feel it in my gut. I strongly doubt a frontier captain will have solid information on an event such as this. We need to locate his government and put the squeeze on them. Michael is starting to grow annoyed with central s jingoism. In fact, now he is wondering if central who seems more evident that it is succumbing to emotional traps, is becoming a problem. Very well, Master. I shall release him. And with that, the data cables connecting to the pinhead interface released with a rather startling hiss. As soon as he was clear, Jur L collapsed to the floor, shaking like a leaf, panting like a runner forced to go an extra mile. After several moments, Jur L finally, but slowly, began to stand himself up. Michael just now realized how small Jur L is, reaching up to where his stomach would be by his guess. Looking him over, Jur L asked, I was told you? Re the last of your kind, yet you look like your robot servants. Central chimed in before he could answer. I dared not remove your nervous system out of the container for fear of infection. If you wish, open your chest plate. Michael already felt sick, but he decided that the only way to accept his new existence was to face his new reality. So with that, he sent a signal to his frame to open his chest. With soft whirring of the micro servo motors, the chest opened up to reveal a cylindrical container filled with neon blue fluid, and within it, the floating remains of Michael. His brain and spinal cord, each important section wired up to relevant areas of his frame. Michael already braced himself, but Jur L took it hard. The reptilian-like alien lost his footing as he backed away. Mandibles spread far, followed by the very obvious sight and sound of vomiting. Michael took that as his cue to close his chest. 
It was rather some time before Jur L regained some ability to speak. I, I am sorry. It's just knowing about the puddles and then seeing, well, you, the imagery got to me. I am still trying to accept it myself, Michael acceded. Out of nowhere, his vision was blocked by a large window. Urgent. Michael opened a channel to Central. What? We have more contacts entering Earth? S. Atmosphere, Michael. The Xeno lied to us? Even though he had no eyes, not anymore, Michael glared right at Jur L. E. V. Just been informed we have guests. Know them? Jur L. S. Eyes went wide. No, the only ships coming here was the colonizer and our escort. And then came the message, in Jur L. S. language that revealed the answer. Attention all ku Rathi. You are wanted by the Council, accused of genocide against an undiscovered pre-FTL civilization. Surrender immediately. Michael looked back to Jur L, still confused. Well, on the one hand, we, Rai, good. On the other, the Council thinks you killed my race. 